Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. Welcome to the episode 212 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Today, we are starting a new mini series on helping you become a better partner in the bedroom if you are in a relationship. Everyone wonders at times that what they're like in the bedroom but we're often not in a position to ask. And even when we're asking for a number of different reasons, we might not get the accurate answer. A few months ago, I developed this quiz that will assess what kind of a lover you are and it gives you a feedback. The quiz is completely free. You can take it. The link is in the show notes. Today, we're going to talk about what makes someone an extraordinary lover. We have Dr. Peggy Klein Platz on our show. She is a sex therapist and a researcher. Dr. Klein Platz is a professor in the Faculty of Medicine and director of Optimal Sexual Experience research team at the University of Ottawa, Canada. Dr. Kleinplatz has edited four books, including Sadomasochism, Powerful Pleasures, Sexuality and Aging, and Notably New Directions in Sex Therapy, Innovation, and Alternatives. Winner of ASAC 2013 Book Award. Dr. Kleinplatz is the author of A Magnificent Sex, Lessons from Extraordinary Lovers, winner of the Society of Sex Therapy and Research Consumer Book Award for 2021. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Kleinplatz. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I'm excited to have Dr. Peggy Kleinplatz in our show. Dr. Kleinplatz, welcome to our show. Thank you, Dr. Morali. I appreciate you inviting me on. I'm very excited about this conversation. As, as I mentioned during the introduction, recently you published a wonderful book. In your book, you talked about a series of the studies that you've done, and, and I think it will be very relevant to my listeners to hear about some of the findings of those studies. So can you share a little bit about that with us? Sure. Well, it all started in 2003, 2004, during that academic year, there was a student in one of my undergraduate classes. Her name was Dana Menard. And she kept on raising her hand, when, no matter what I was covering in class, and saying, well, in Cosmo, it says this. And in Men's Health, it says that. And, you know, how come the research you're covering is so different from everything we hear about in the media, or even the stuff that's portrayed in pornography. And she was such an inquisitive student. And I just loved working with her. So she ended up becoming my graduate student. And today she's Dr. Dana Menard and professor of psychology at the University of Windsor. And in order to find out about the reality of deeply fulfilling sexual relations, rather than relying on the stuff in the media, we decided to study it ourselves. So the first thing we needed to do was find people who are having really special sex lives that were growing over time. I mean, I'm sure in your work, you know that there are all kinds of myths saying, you know, sex is only for the young and beautiful, or, you know, really hot sex is only possible at the beginning of a relationship. You've heard all that. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you say that it's possible to have wonderful, fulfilling sex life and later in life as sex therapists, we know that, but I feel like most people think that's a trade-off of being in a relationship. So I'm, wonder, I'm so excited that you did this wonderful study on that. Thank you for the feedback. One of the first things we decided to do was study the most mainstream and yet marginalized people, old married people, people who were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and who'd been together for at least 30 years. And we interviewed them. It took several years to interview all the people that we interviewed, but it, it was such a blessing to be able to talk to people who were in fulfilling sex lives that got better and better over time. So our team's latest book, Magnificent Sex, Lessons from Extraordinary Lovers, is the labor of love that comes from those interviews, from being able to talk to people 
whose sex lives improved over time and to find out what they did right. So instead of all the focus on, you know, this problem and that problem, we wanted to study people who did everything right and whose sex lives were incredibly fulfilling. So what was it that we could learn from them? Dr. Kleinplatz, I'm kind of curious, how did you define fulfilling sex life and how did you recruit these people? Well, I'm in Canada, but we went to the American Association of Retired People and the Canadian Association of Retired People. We went to churches, we went to synagogues, we went to radio shows that we listened, that we knew that older people listened to. And we said that we were looking to speak with individuals and couples who had been together for at least 30 years and were in their 60s, 70s or 80s, and who self-defined as having wonderful, fulfilling, remarkable, magnificent, memorable sex lives and what they were doing right. And we were flooded with responses very quickly. Oh, we wow. had more people wanting to be interviewed than we would have had time to interview in a decade or more, in a lifetime. Well, that's certainly wonderful news because most people, as I said, that they feel like in a, especially later stages of life, people that don't have sex and especially it's challenging to be in a fulfilling partner partner, sexual, sexual relationship. So it's wonderful that you found this many people who were interested. So tell us a little bit about the findings that you got from these interesting couples and individuals. Yeah. So we've done a whole series of studies, but I'll tell you about the first study first and then maybe more later. In the first study, we literally wanted to know how they defined the best sexual experiences. And so we asked them, you know, what is it? What makes it happen? What does it look like? What are the elements of extremely fulfilling sexual experiences? And over the course of interviewing dozens and dozens of people, we found that there were eight components. And I'm happy to take you through them if you'd like. Please do, yes. So the first of them was being present in the moment, being so focused, so absorbed in each other in the moment that an atom bomb could drop and you wouldn't notice. So a lot of times people are complaining to me as a sex therapist, you know, it's very hard for me to put down my to-do list. And did I remember to take my clothes out of the machine and put them in the dryer? Oh, I hope they aren't getting crushed. I hate ironing. Those people probably are not engaging in really wonderful sex. Really wonderful sex is compelling and pretty well forces you or invites you. That's a better word. Invites you to be present in the moment. So that's the first component that pretty much everybody mentioned. The second one is about being aligned with your partner, being connected. You know, it's, it's not something that psychologists typically write about, but it is something that the poets and songwriters talk about when they talk about two hearts that beat as one. And of course, if I can jump ahead to one of our subsequent studies, it's one thing to be present when you're alone in a yoga class or a meditation class or mindfulness class. It's quite something to be fully present while also fully engaged and immersed in another human's intimate experience. So it's how to get those two together that ended up being the subject of some of our later research. Our third component was deep sexual and erotic intimacy. And this requires a bit of subtlety to think about. I mean, normally we think about love, love, love and hearts and Valentine's Day stuff, and it's more complex than that. What we picked up on was that this was about really deep liking, caring, respect, appreciation. It's almost as if our participants didn't use the word love because we throw the word around love so easily when we say, you know, oh, I, I, I love this flavor of ice cream. I love going for a walk on a sunny day. That's different from the way we really care deeply for a partner. So they talked about caring and respect and deep liking. Well, can I ask a follow-up question on that? I know that many, of many of the recent studies, they talk about the importance of mindfulness, being present mm -hmm. in the moment, which 
which exactly that's what you're talking about. And even for treatments of low desire, I know your your approach is focusing on strengthening and having wonderful sexual experiences. But f- even for individuals who have like women with low desire, now it's recommended mindfulness and working and trying to be present. It's my experience that when I work with couples and they talk about, we talk about mindfulness and being present, they value that. But if we're having the same kind of sexual experiences with the same partner that we've been together for decades and decades, it's hard to remain focused. It's almost when you're driving from work to home and at times like after a while you check out. So how do you recommend people to lean into that and cultivate that elements of being present? Yeah, so there's being present, there's being present. So we borrowed the term mindfulness from ancient Buddhist and Hindu practice, where it wasn't something that you would learn in a weekend-long mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy weekend. It was something to be developed over the course of a lifetime and truly a religious discipline. So mindfulness, the way we often throw it around in psychology circles, is a kind of dumbed-down version And I think the kind of being present that my participants were talking about was more like the ancient version, where it isn't something that you cultivate quickly. It is something that requires practice and discipline over the course of a lifetime so that it can grow. So nothing wrong with mindfulness, but it depends what you mean by mindfulness. What level of mindfulness is the issue? Well, it's my experience, like even the recent study that I'm sure you're well aware that came from Canada, they, they talked about women getting uh, practicing and doing mindfulness eating and paying 20 minutes of kind of doing the more unquote, more quote unquote, more new way, way of uh, practicing mindfulness. So even with that, they noticed some changes in sexual pleasure. So it's it's interesting and great that many people, it seems like in your study, talked about they were able to cultivate that. The other thought that I have is about this deep sexual erotic component that you talked about. Tell us more about that. What what? How did you guys define that? Oh, we didn't define anything. It's the participants who did the defining. This is phenomenological research also known as discovery-oriented research. So rather than coming in with our own hypotheses, we left it to the participants to define all eight of the components for us. So we didn't have any idea as to what the components would be until the participants described what was critical for their experience, optimal erotic intimacy, and we are merely the conduits for their description, which, as I said, was very much about respect, caring, liking, appreciation, And that, of course, brings me into our next component. The fifth component was about empathic communication. So most psychologists learn in graduate school about how to help couples in conflict with low-level communication skills, effective communication skills, I statements, validation, paraphrasing. But the people we interviewed were black belt communicators. They were exceptionally skilled communicators. So it was both skill at speaking, being very articulate, as well as listening open-mindedly and being able to hear what your partner wanted to say. But it didn't just stop at verbal communication. It was also about touch. So if we can think about some of the causes, for example, of pain on intercourse, we know that one of them is when a person's body is very tight. And sure enough, If you think about the way your body tightens up when you're sitting in a cold doctor's office with only a hospital gown on and you're waiting to be examined, when that doctor goes to touch you, that doctor will find out that your body is fairly tight. But these people were experts in touching so as to really feel what was going on under the skin of their partners. So touching so as to feel, but also allowing oneself to be touched so as to be known through the beloved partner's caress. So it's the opposite of guarding against the intrusion of of someone who is going to be touching you in a way that's anxiety-provoking. These people were very good at empathic touch. And then the next component is about exploration, interpersonal risk-taking. It's about using the sexual relationship as a vehicle for personal growth, and interpersonal growth and maturity. It's about not being afraid, but rather being courageous 
in the way we make love. And then our seventh component is about authenticity, allowing oneself to be known, being emotionally naked, being genuine or transparent with a partner. And again, that's that's hard enough to do if you're alone in your bedroom, looking in your mirror, literally or figuratively. Our seventh component is about surrender. It's about being vulnerable to someone you have to face again the next day. And if it's hard to be authentic alone, it's even harder to let yourself be vulnerable with someone that you care about. And our final component is about transcendence and transformation. So this is really about the result of those other seven components. Sometimes when two people are connecting in just the right way, with deep honesty and vulnerability and willingness to be known, that can be a healing and transformative process where both people are richer at the end by virtue of having been touched literally and metaphorically in just those ways. So that brought us to the end of our first study way back in 2007. Wonderful. So I have a few follow-up studies, uh, questions for about this studies that I'm sure, like, I want to make sure that our listeners also can envision this. So you recruited this couple's team from the different places, which is wonderful, from the religious programs and also from radio and all these wonderful places, and you interviewed them, and you found this. These are these were the common themes that came up from those studies. That's how you guys arrived to these seven categories. Eight, yes. Eight categories, okay. And how many did you guys do the kind of individual, kind of like individual or the couple? And so I'm kind of curious, was it that kind of focus on the individual or that you were questioning the both couples? We interviewed each person separately so that if we interviewed the partner, they didn't even have time to talk to each other between one interview and the next so that we could hear each person's account separately, even if they were in the same relationship. Great. Were you able to look at the differences of the, I'm curious to see if you had couples and one, one partner experienced this fulfilling, wonderful sexual experience, but the, the partner were not necessarily had the same experience. It was very interesting. You know, phenomenologists are not supposed to look at similarities and differences, but we couldn't help but notice the incredible similarities among our participants. They each described their experiences in remarkably similar ways. So that only Dr. Menard and I had access to the full transcript, including, for example, demographic information. And yet all the other members of our research team were rating these de-identified anonymized transcripts And they would make comments like, oh, that woman sounds really interesting, or boy, that man has had really rich experiences. And she and I would say, what makes you say that that's a woman, or what makes you say that that's a man? And they would say, well, isn't that obvious? And they got it wrong every time, every time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is it's just fascinating to us that at the high end of the range of human erotic intimacy, men and women are indistinguishable. It may be that when you study bad sex or even normal sex, whatever that is, that there may be differences between men and women. But at the high end, no, we're all alike under under the skin. Well, one thing I'm curious to learn more about as you're talking about these eight categories, it seems like this, these are more the essence of a person. Like there are people that are, are show up authentically on all aspects of their life. They are more present. So they are kind of like they're more empathic. For our listeners, I wonder if they're curious to see if these are the qualities that one can acquire. I love your question. It took us from 2005 to 2012 after careful study to realize, hey, these are peak experiences in the way that Maslow wrote about them of some very special people. But were these experiences that were only available to special people, the kind of people that Maslow would have called the self-actualizers, or are these kinds of experiences available to anyone? And back in 2012, that was still an empirical question for which we did not yet have an answer. Now, I don't know about you, but the most common problem that I see in my clinical practice is sexual desire discrepancy, where one person wants more sex than the other, the frequency is unsatisfying to both, and they're in distress about it. And they seek out therapy because of concerns about desire and frequency. Does that sound familiar? 
Yes, yes, absolutely. A big part of my practice is also that the challenges that people have around that and the secondary issues that, that show up in the relationship because of that discrepancy. Exactly. So starting in 2012, after we'd finished all our interviews, we decided to answer that empirical question that you've just asked. Is this, is this something anybody can have? And then we went a step further. I said, you know, I feel really guilty because my waiting list is over seven months long. And sometimes I'll call a couple back after five months on my waiting list saying, hey, I can get you in in only six weeks from now. Let's set something up. And they'd say, thanks, but no thanks. We got divorced a month ago. And I would feel so terrible about having kept people waiting when maybe if I'd seen them sooner, I would have been able to help more or help at all before it was too late. So we decided to do two things at once. One was to get rid of my waiting list. And two was to apply the findings from all the people that we'd interviewed, all 75 of them, to see if we could develop a treatment model that would be therapeutic for couples with concerns about sexual desire discrepancy and do it by setting up group therapy so that we could triage all the people on my waiting list into group therapy as quickly as possible for purposes of not keeping people waiting, but getting them help as soon as possible. But also, for a lot of people, seeing a psychologist is inaccessible. It's just too expensive. And I thought, if we could get people to group therapy, the fee for them would be much, much lower. So maybe we could make therapy accessible to more people more quickly and with less cost. So starting in 2013, we began to do group therapy. And by 2016, it was pretty clear from groups that I'd run with my co-facilitator, Nicholas Paradis, and with other groups that were being run by members of my team, holy cow, this works. So we would study people when they first came in, and then at eight weeks at the end of the group therapy, so it's 16 hours over eight weeks, and then six-month follow-up to see if the changes they'd made were sustained, even without any further therapeutic intervention, and they were. So in 2016, we decided that we would start training other therapists. And so far, we've trained people from Vermont to San Francisco and throughout the Midwest, and then we looked at their data. Were therapists able to help not just anyone, but people who were especially distressed by the effect it was having on their marriage that they were arguing about frequency of sex and the low desire and high desire partner were, as you said, having secondary issues arise. Could we help them in only eight weeks? And it turned out we could. And so could all the people we've been training throughout North America. Well, that's fascinating. And considering the length of some of the kind of treatment that people get eight weeks was nothing. And so are these clinicians and therapists, are they also doing it in a group setting or it's an individual therapy, kind of couple of therapy sessions that they're doing with these clients? No, it's, it's group therapy. And of course, you know, everybody's first concern is confidentiality. So we always tell everybody in advance, come up with some pseudonyms that work for you. And usually they choose names from TV. So we've had a Fred and Wilma Flintstone. (laughs) We've had a Tony and Carmela Soprano. We've had some characters from The Office, which I'd never seen. So everybody else in the group cracked up when they first heard the names of these characters, except me, because I didn't didn't recognize the names from that TV show. And yes, people are constantly choosing pseudonyms to guarantee their confidentiality. But yes, for us, the social justice aspect of making sure that marriages are helped before it's too late is very important to us. So we're training therapists everywhere to offer group therapy so that we can help as many people as we can as fast as we can. Well, that's fantastic. And the willingness of people showing up, because I know I would imagine it's the same in Canada as well, that even with things that are not as stigmatizing, as kind of challenges around sex in, in people's mind, it's hard to still go to group therapy. If it, uh, you're telling me that this wonderfully, wi- wildly accepted groups are because I, I, it feels like these treatments are effective, so people are willing to be part of it. So with this kind of trainings with these groups, is it mostly psychoeducation, like meaning like teaching people skills? Is it skill-based or is, uh, there is an element of process there as well? Only the first three hours are psychoeducational, where we talk about some of the messages that people learned growing up about sexuality and whether those have been harmful or helpful. 
But after that, we move straight into process. And we use group process very powerfully. So many people who have sexual problems feel, as you say, stigmatized, feel defective. They must be the only ones in the world who are having sexual problems. Everybody's assuming that everybody else is having more sex than they are, better sex than they are, that they're all hopping around like little inner mm-hmm. bunnies. And everyone's eager to keep up with the Joneses. And one of the powerful elements of group therapy is to discover, hey, I'm not the only one who's got this problem. You also have two jobs, a household to keep up, children running underfoot. This isn't easy. And wow, I'm not the only one who's struggling with this. And that's very validating. I personally love that I used to run lots of groups when I was working in a hospital setting. And I think the process is is a big part of group treatment because you get feedback from the other group members. And sometimes when our partners say something, we're not, we might not receive it the same way that if we're hearing it from the group. So it's, it's wonderful that there is this two element of psychoeducation and process. Tell us, does this group, does this training teach people specific skills around how to be a good lover? You know, interestingly, You picked up on the crucial element before when you said it's about the kind of human being that you are. So we never focus on the things going on between the legs. There is no sensate focus set of exercises. We're focusing on the way people connect. We're focusing on what it takes in a relationship to be fulfilling enough so that it's worthwhile to be genuine and authentic and vulnerable on what are the elements between two people that would make them feel, if I want to grow, that I want to grow with you. I want our relationship to grow in depth. So this isn't about technical skills. This is the opposite of the Cosmo or Vogue or Men's Health or Maxim or porn kind of lesson. This is not about tips and tricks and techniques. It's an entirely different mentality that's about growing together over time. Well, also what I hear, it's wonderful that if you're able to learn the skills, then it can benefit all aspects of your life because again, the mindfulness being present now is recommended for overall mental wellness in all sorts of studies and also the quality of being that you're sharing with us that completely is something that people can learn that can change their relationship, I can imagine, in the office, with coworkers, with relatives. So this is the skill that's, as you said, but it's not necessarily focused, doesn't sound like on kind of only intimate part of you, part of your life, but also relates to how you show up in the world. I would hope so, and I would think so from the feedback we've already received. A lot of people have mentioned that especially some of the empathic communication that they develop during the group therapy also ends up being very helpful with their children. Well, that makes sense. That It seems like it's almost this quality in being attuned to others that, that can mm-hmm. be useful in all aspects of life. So I bet our listeners are now very curious about how can they learn these skills. So can you tell us where, where, where are some of the places? I know you have the book, but I'm also curious if you have training. So tell us more about where can people access these services? Well, until quite recently, all the mental health professionals who were learning about this had to fly into Ottawa, Canada, Ottawa being the capital of Canada, which is where I'm located at the University of Ottawa. And I'm director of the Optimal Sexual Experiences Research Team at the University of Ottawa. But we're now in the middle of a pandemic. And so my team and I are actually offering the training to mental health professionals online. And mental health professionals are now going back to their own communities and offering the services there. So if anyone's interested in contacting our team, our website is OptimalSexualExperiences.com. Excellent. And the information will be in the show notes. So if people want to get a hold of that information, that would be one place to find it. And also, I know you you wrote multiple books. So that, that also will include that information in the show notes as well. Is there anything else that you want to make sure before we're closing this conversation that our listeners know about this work? Well, if I go back to your question, you know, is this possible for anyone? I believe it is. I wouldn't have 10 years ago, but I've seen so many couples who were struggling, who hadn't had sex in 10 years and who are now having 
much more fulfilling, sexually intimate relations, that I'm feeling quite optimistic that there's much room for growth in lots of different kinds of relationships that are struggling. Well, that's definitely very hopeful to hear uh, because I know that uh, sometimes people feel like I am who I am and I can change a little bit, but I'm hearing that there is this possibility of people getting access to quality of being can, that can transform their sexual experiences. So I feel that's very powerful. And thank you so much for sharing this information and part of your research studies with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. I hope you guys found the information useful and gave you some ideas on what to do to improve your skills as a lover. As always, I'm so grateful for every single one of you guys that tune in to this show. As a reminder, I relaunched my Farsi podcast. So if you're a Farsi speaking individual, make sure you are checking out my Farsi sexology podcast. And please feel free to send me your questions and I would be happy happy to answer all of the questions that you have on this show. All right, I'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.